Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about auxiliary verbs. But first, we're doing a fun experiment. Are there linguistics things in your life that you would like advice about? Whether that's serious advice or somewhat silly advice, we're going to do a special linguistics advice bonus episode for our seventh anniversary coming up in November 2023 with questions from patrons. Ask us your question by following the link in the show notes by September 1st, 2023, and we'll have the episode as our bonus in November 2023. Our most recent bonus episode was a discussion about linguistics and jobs, including a behind the scenes on a new academic paper that brings together seven years of interviews with people who have done linguistics and gone on to interesting careers. You can go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm to get access to these and upcoming bonus episodes. And also because our patrons are what lets us make the show and we don't run advertising. If you like that lingthusiasm continues to exist, we always appreciate patronage at any level. Today, Gretchen, we're going on an excursion to a farm. Ooh, what are we going to see at the farm? We're going to see all kinds of animals that we're going to use as our example sentences. Uh, the first is this horse, and the horse is eating grass. Ah, look at the horse. The horse has eaten an apple. Oh, what a nice treat. Both sentences, the horse is eating grass and the horse has eaten an apple, are about the verb eat, but they're structured a little differently. Yeah, they've got something in common, which is that they have a main verb, eat, is eating grass, has eaten an apple, and also a second helping verb that's less important when it comes to how we'd like draw a nice picture of the scenario, but gives us some useful grammatical information. And these verbs have their own life as well when they're not hanging out alongside another verb and helping it. So the horse is eating grass is the same verb as in the horse is an animal. Here is is doing the work of painting a picture of what's happening. The is is the whole verb by itself. It doesn't have any helpers. And the same thing with something like the horse has an apple. Oh, lucky horse. <laughs> lucky horse. We don't know whether it's eaten yet, but the has there doesn't have any helpers. It's not helping. It's just the only verb. Whereas in the horse is eating grass, the horse has eaten an apple, you have eat, which is your sort of primary verb, star of the show, and then that is or has that's helping it out. And those verby things that are helping another verb are known as auxiliary verbs. Yeah, auxiliary is the type of terminology you're like, wow, that's a long word for such a short verb. <laughs> yes, it's a very fancy word for when often very short verbs are used to help another verb. And it's because it's just the very fancy French borrowed word for help. Yeah, it's this French word which was borrowed from Latin, meaning helpful or aiding. You do sometimes see an auxiliary, um, like an auxiliary armed force or like a lady's auxiliary in like a historical military context. <laughs> True. Yes, that is where you may have also encountered the word auxiliary outside of linguistics. I wouldn't say it's super common, but there we go. You know, sometimes you do see people just refer to them as helping words, which is also extremely defensible. But the technical formal word that linguists use is auxiliary, which is sometimes shortened nicely to aux, just A-U-X. And we have auxiliary verbs in English, like the examples we just shared. And we can explore how auxiliary verbs work in other languages as well, thanks to a very conveniently timed launch of a new database called GramBank. This is very good and coincidental timing. If you've listened to previous episodes of Lingthusias, you might have heard us talk about WALLS, which is the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures, which does these cool diagrams of where various linguistic features are found. GramBank is sort of like the new WALLS. So let's talk a little bit about, do you know the history of how these two sites came to be? WALLS has been our go-to for almost 20 years. It started out in 2005 as a CD-ROM. Oh my god, <laughs> I didn't realize that it used to be a CD-ROM. And only came online in 2008. The way that WALLS works is that an individual researcher would come up with a question and they would survey as many grammars as they could and then share their results. The way that GramBank works is instead they started with almost 200 different features of how the grammar of a language can work. 
And then they had a massive team. There's over 100 named authors on the Grand Bank big initial publication. And those 100 plus authors went through over 2,000 different grammars of different languages, looking for each of those 195 different features to put in the database. So it's a very different process. So that's both more questions than Walls, which has around Mm -hmm. 90 some questions, and also way more languages. Generally, when you see a language map in Walls, it's got like maybe about 500 languages, somewhere between like four and 800 languages, whereas there's like thousands of languages in each of the Grand Bank databases. Not the full maybe 7,000 that we think exist, but like 2,000, 2,500 is certainly a lot closer to having some sense of like, what do things look like cross-linguistically? And so to pull an example of a grammar completely not at random, uh, <laughs> one of the one of the coders used my grammar of Lam Jung Yolmo, and they picked up the grammar and they opened it up and they literally went through their list of 195 questions looking for the answers in the grammar and added it to the database. And this is, I think, such a tremendous example of how the work of linguistics involves so many different people because mm-hmm. each of the grammars that this database is using as input and that a database like Walls also uses as input is written by one person or a group of people and can be several hundred pages long and take like five or 10 years. And then you have another group of 100 plus people spending all this time looking through the grammars and trying to compare them and extract things that make them comparable to each other when grammars are sort of written in different traditions at different times uh, by different people with different interests and sort of try to do something that lets you compare them with respect to each other. And one thing that Grand Bank does really well is that it's really transparent about the methods that it uses. There's an entire wiki that goes along with it that explains the process and the methods and what terminology they're using and why. And I think that really helps to make sure that everyone is as much on the same page as possible when it comes to making these decisions. And if you had somebody who's writing a new grammar, they could look at these 195 questions and say, I could just provide answers for them, Mm -hmm. you know, in an appendix or something at the end. So you could just encode them more directly in a future version of Grand Bank. Are they planning on doing that? This is definitely version 1.0. And there is scope to expand both the number of features they look at and the number of grammars that are included in the future, which is also really exciting. And it's all freely available online, so if you want to poke around and see what's in it, that's a thing that anybody can do. Walls absolutely still has value. I'm sure that we will continue to refer to it when it's useful, but I'm excited that we'll also get to use Grand Bank for future episodes as well. Yeah, and they ask slightly different sets of questions, so it's still worth having both sets of resources. Um, But since we have auxiliaries today, Mm -hmm. and since Walls doesn't do much with auxiliaries, this is a great time to say, what does Grand Bank tell us about auxiliaries in 2000 plus languages? And before we do that, we have to decide what is an auxiliary in any given language. Like all of those people that wrote those two and a half thousand references that are included in Grand Bank. And uh, that means that we have to think about what are some of the most important features when we're talking about something as an auxiliary. Right. So I think a sort of basic working definition of an auxiliary is that when you have multiple verbs in the same phrase, like has eaten, and one of them contributes the most to the meaning, and other ones have grammatical function and don't really have much with their own meaning. So in something like the horse has an apple, have has a meaning of owning or possession or belonging to. Whereas in something like the horse has eaten, it's not the horse owns or possesses or belongs to the state of having eaten. So it's an auxiliary in that case where it's helping out the other verb with grammatical functions. And as we're going through these examples, I think just like we might go for a wander around the hypothetical farm we're talking about today, we're also just wandering through these examples and not getting too bogged down on making a complete list. We have that list in the Cambridge Grammar of the English Language. It's a very big and heavy book. Speaking of reference works that take multiple people to do, this is also some thousand plus pages and has like 12 co-authors. You know, there's many people at every level of this process trying to describe what's going on in a language. So this is not an exhaustive tour. So in English, we've talked about is and has having auxiliary functions. We also have do, as in the horse does eat grass, Mm. which is different to do in its main form as the horse does a dance, maybe for some dressage. (laughs) 
<laughs> the horse does a little dance, does a little <laughs> jump. That's sort of do as its canonical by itself independent verb form, whereas the horse does eat grass is doing a grammatical thing. Similarly, with an example like the grass was eaten by the horse, mm-hmm. maybe by a stray goat, um, the was there is doing a grammatical thing and eaten is the main verb. The grass was eaten by the horse is a really nifty example of how the auxiliary is helping by making the grass the focus and creating this passive structure. Right. So sometimes like the horse is eating grass or the horse has eaten grass, this locates the event of grass eating in time and sort of the timeline of how this event has happened. And sometimes it can change how the entities in the sentence relate to each other. There's lots of different things that auxiliaries can do. Another example of what auxiliaries can do that's not from my variety of English is the horse be eating grass in African-American vernacular English, where instead of the is form of the verb, you have the be form. And that means that it's being used in a way that means the horse regularly or habitually eats grass. Right, which I think is a true thing about horses. I think so. (laughs) Neither of us are particularly uh, horse experts. (laughs) One of the papers that I like to cite about this construction, which is called Habitual Bee, uses Cookie Monster Bee Eating Cookies as the example, which is definitely true about Cookie Monsters. Mm -hmm. And even if Cookie Monster is not currently eating cookies, this is a thing that is habitually true about Cookie Monster as as an entity. It is a really helpful auxiliary. Yeah. So it's interesting how auxiliaries are often drawn from this relatively limited set of words. And here we've seen be and is, which are part of the same verb, be used in three different ways as slightly different flavors of auxiliary in English. Mm -hmm. Because it's sort of this small set of auxiliaries, then you can do all these interesting grammatical things with them. And there are all these downstream effects of what happens when you have an auxiliary. So because it's being used to help in terms of what it's contributing to the grammar, It means that it's not coming along with its own meaning as central. And because they no longer bring their own meaning while they're helping, you get sentences which, if you don't treat them as an auxiliary, sound a little bit contradictory. So, I am going to come to the farm. Because going is the auxiliary there, you can use it with come, which has the opposite meaning if you're thinking about the meaning of both of these verbs. Can you say, I'm coming to go to the farm? It would be like, I'm coming to your house and then we'll go to the farm together. So it's not really an auxiliary. The one that I really like is, so have, which can be an auxiliary or not an auxiliary, is very often pronounced differently in English. It's spelled the same way, but it's pronounced differently in English depending on which one it is. Huh. Let me try this little uh, quiz for you. If I say, I have two pens Mm -hmm. versus I have to pen up the chickens. Okay. Did you notice the difference between how have is pronounced there? I have two pens and I have to, I have to, I I, I have to pen up the chicks. I could make that really short. Yeah. And one of them is have pronounced with the V and have to. The other one is have to pen with like an F sound, which you could write like hmm. have to. It would be sort of weird, I think, to say I have to pens to mean I have two pens. I don't think I can do that. She has to she has to duck because a chicken is flying over her head versus she has two ducks. Right. So that's has, which gets pronounced with like a Z when it's has two ducks. So when it's helping, it's no longer the star of the show. We can kind of smooth down the edges of how we pronounce it. Yeah, and make that S or that V more like the T that's coming after. And yeah, change the sound. She ha- She has to duck. I think if you say something like she has to duck, it sounds very formal. Like you can do it, but it sounds very, very formal. Mm -hmm. I have to pen up the chickens. (laughs) She has to duck. I just have to say it so slowly (laughs) in order to not make the to into t and the have into half and has. And that works for other ones as well. Like I'm gonna come to the farm. Right. Like I'm gonna the farm. Maybe you can say it in some very informal or relaxed varieties. That's a very informal Australian sounding pronunciation there. But like, I'm gonna milk the cows or something is very, like, that's just the one that means sort of future. One that I like is, so you can say, I've gone away, and you've reduced that have. You know, the auxiliary, it's shortened from I have gone away. Have just reduced to the there. But I've the milk, do you, do you have that? Oh, now you sound British. 
in my head. <laughs> yeah, I, I have the milk and I have the eggs. Um, I think I would have to say in my Canadian English, I would say I've got the milk mm-hmm. or something like that. I'd have to reinforce the meaning there if I want to shorten it. Yeah. And I really don't think I would say I've to go to mean I have to go. <laughs> no, much harder to shorten a main verb than a helper verb. Yeah, I could say I gotta go, I have to go, but it's not quite something I can shorten in that context. So auxiliaries tend to have these sorts of contractions um, because they're sort of grammary things, they're very high frequency. Fun fact about high frequency. Yes. So there's a very fun study that finds that words that are unexpected in their context or that are less frequent overall in a language tend to be produced over a longer period of time, like slower with longer duration. The example from this that I really like, which is, uh, so there's a a word can't, like a thieves can't or a, you know, the can't of the streets. Mm -hmm. And you can tell by me saying it sort of with the definition, it's not super common, like an Argo, you know, like I, I heard the can't of the streets going through the night. This tends to be produced much longer and slower and more precisely than I can't, as in I can't go, uh, I cannot go. I can't say can't with the same vowel, so uh, it doesn't work for me. But it does make sense because these auxiliaries are really hardworking helpers. They turn up in sentences so often and they don't contribute that meaning. It makes sense that they would be the thing most likely to reduce. Yeah, they're sort of squished down because they're just sort of being grammatical glue between the sort of big meaning heavy chunks of words. And once we figure out, okay, this counts as an auxiliary, it's helping the verb in this language, we can then start saying, like, what else do auxiliaries do in a particular language that might be of interest when you start zooming in very narrowly on one language? I know auxiliaries and how we ask questions in English interact in interesting ways. Right. Let's look at some examples of questions. We could have, is the horse eating grass? Has the horse eaten grass? Does the horse eat grass? And in all of these, the auxiliary is at the start. Is the horse, has the horse, does the horse. Right. And eat is further back. It is further back. And when those same verbs are used as sort of main verbs rather than auxiliaries, it gets a bit weirder. So eats the horse grass. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Mm, That doesn't fit with my grammar. Yeah, this does exist in the history of English. It's still something you can say in other Germanic languages, but it's not something that's for most present day English speakers. How do you feel about does the horse dance? You sound very theatrical, (laughs) which is usually a way of saying that it is a more archaic form of English. Mm -hmm. What about has the horse an apple? Yep, very similar vibes. I feel like that one sounds a bit British to me also, but is the horse an animal? Oh, that's a perfectly normal sentence to my ears. I sometimes have to double check after hearing a bunch of things that I'm questionable about. <laughs> so I, oh, yeah, that is that is a sentence. That's why I did it in that order, just so you could have that happen to you. Yeah, so this is sort of a, a downstream thing that happens with English auxiliaries if you don't have an auxiliary in the sentence, like eats the horse grass, you have to put one in, mm-hmm. does the horse eat grass, or can the horse eat grass. But for some reason, is is an exception. I don't know. Is is a bit weird. You can check out our Copulous episode for more. These are why these aren't quite used as a diagnostic for auxiliaries. It's just sort of a thing that happens afterward. Once again, there's a reason the Cambridge grammar of the English language is the size of a relatively healthy cat. (laughs) A nice farm cat. So far, we've only had examples of sentences with a single auxiliary, but they are so helpful that they're willing to stack up and have more than one to help create even more complex meaning in a sentence. So if you leave a big barrel of apples on the farm and there's a bunch of goats around, by the time you get back into the room, you might see that the apples will have been being eaten by the goats for the whole day. Oh no, it's a sad situation, (laughs) but a very exciting use of, what's that, four auxiliaries? Will have been being. Yep. And then eaten. Exciting day for the goats, exciting day for the auxiliaries, not so exciting for the humans who want to eat the apples. And we still have one main verb, which is eaten, because that's still the action that's happening. And then all of these other auxiliaries are telling us things about how and when and under what circumstances this event happened. So do have and be are doing a lot of heavy lifting in English. We also had a whole episode on modals, which are also like auxiliaries in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, modals are sort of interesting in English because they don't act like full verbs. So you mm -hmm. can't just say, I can the apple. Yeah. Or I will the apple. I should the apple. <laughs> <laughs> but you can use them in the same sort of auxiliary slot and helping slot as other auxiliaries that are verbs. So sometimes people talk about sort of auxiliaries as a category that includes verbs that are definitely verby, like be and have and do, and other things that are maybe not verby, but they're still doing what seems to be the same sort of helping thing as these helping verbs. And alongside our really common helpers, there are some occasional helpers. Uh, let is a really nice example. Ooh. Something like, let's go. Yeah. Let's go, which is originally let us go, which sounds very formal mm -hmm. to me, and doesn't quite say, mean the same thing as like, let my people go, let us go. It just means <laughs> like, shall we go? Or let, let's us, the group of us go. Or let there be light. Let there be peace, mm. which is sort of used as a formal command. So let can be an auxiliary because you have these other main verbs like go and be. And that's a really nice example of how auxiliaries can kind of fork off from their main verb usage and go on their own little adventures. And they're often kind of weird or irregular because they'll keep this grammatical function that's separate from their main meaning function. Yeah, this grammatical idiosyncrasy of auxiliaries was something that came up a lot when I was learning French. Mm -hmm. I know you haven't studied French, but my <laughs> experience with French was that we spent years and years and years uh, learning this one particular thing about French verbs, which is known as the passé composé, which is how to make a certain type of past verb in French. That if you were translating literally, you could translate it as something like, I have eaten, I have arrived. But it's used to just mean a sort of general past thing. Like there's a there's a have word there, but it's used to mean a past thing. Oh, it's nice that it uses have as an auxiliary like English does. Big shout out to have. I feel like we could have a whole have episode. We really could. And in this case, it is have most of the time, but sometimes instead of have, it's be. Okay. This is why it took so long to learn. Yeah. They mean the same thing. There's just for a word like eat, you use have. But for a word like arrive or come or descend, you use be. Okay. So it's our old friends have and be. But in this case, it's like some verbs get have and some verbs get be. This is actually something that existed historically in English and still exists in a little bit in German, where you can kind of say in English, I have come or I am arrived. True. They both work. In a way that with other types of verbs, if you say something like, I am laughed. Okay, that definitely doesn't <laughs> sit well with my intuitions. <laughs> no. <laughs> or if you say, I am eaten, again, well, that means something very different. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to stay away from those goats. They're very vicious. <laughs> help, help, I'm being eaten alive. <laughs> Yeah, but you can say, I am arrived in a way that's a little bit old fashioned, oldie timey in English, but doesn't sound nearly as out there as I am laughed for I have laughed. Yeah. But in French, this is obligatory. Some verbs are like, j'ai mangé, I have eaten. And some verbs are like, je suis arrivé, I am arrived. And this is this whole thing that you need to just learn if you're learning French. It's also the case in Italian. There's some stuff <laughs> in Spanish about like, which auxiliary verb you need to choose when in these particular grammatical circumstances. That is the kind of thing that shows up if you're learning one of these languages. And a good reminder, even if two languages use their languages verb for have, doesn't mean they always use them in exactly the same places and in exactly the same ways. Right. One of my favorite examples of how a word can become sort of grammaticalized and then almost lose its original literal meaning comes from Spanish. Okay. Where you have a verb haber, which is spelled with an H, and you can sort of see its roots to Latin habeo, which is to have. And this is used for grammatical functions, uh, like el caballo ha comida, the horse has eaten. Mm -hmm. But it's no longer really used in most cases for have as in to own or to possess. Huh. So it's so helpful that it stopped having its own life and now is just helping out. This is a metaphor, you know, don't give up on your dreams, Aber. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now you have tener, which, you, you know, is from Latin and means something like to hold or to keep. And you can say something like, el caballo tiene una manzana, the horse has an apple, as like to have and to hold. 
which is not the same verb at all that's used for has eaten, but historically have was used for both. And then they were like, oh, no, <laughs> let's 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 take this other one to mean the more literal meaning of have. On the topic of same verb, Latin, habeo, and English have related, not related? Uh, you know, this is the thing that really gets me. They really look like I they want should them to be, be, and they are not. Oh, wow. Plot twist. <laughs> Plot twist. They are not. You could look this up. Uh, we have looked this up. It's kind of cute, like the Wiktionary entry for both habeo and for have are like they're not related guys i'm sorry we promise here's all the reasons um, which is why it's always good to double check these things and in fact we don't think that there was a common indo-european root for a uh, word meaning have because it's like forked in the descendant languages oh gotta save it for the have episode oh yes yeah, sorry <laughs> <laughs> one day we will have an episode about have <laughs> So acknowledging that auxiliaries can look different in different languages, have slightly different functions, have different downstream effects, let's return to Grand Bank and have a look at what they have to say about the spread of auxiliaries across the world's languages. Yeah, I want to find out. So the nature of a database means that we can look at the types of questions they have asked, and they've asked if auxiliaries are used for a range of different functions across the world's languages. One of those functions is, as we've seen in English, things like is eating, has eaten, things that have to do with when and how and in relation to what an event is taking place. And that is the most common use of auxiliary verbs across the world's languages. It's way more than 30% of the world's languages, according to the coding that's been done, have that kind of auxiliary. This is formerly known as tense mood and aspect. We've done episodes about some of these topics and may do episodes about others of them in the future. The next most common use for auxiliary verbs is to use in negation, which is not quite something we have in English. Right. So in English, we have you can make a negation by putting not after an auxiliary, or depending on how you sort of want to analyze it, you can add nt to the auxiliary. So you can say, you know, the horse is not eating grass, which mm -hmm. not is not acting like a verb there. I can't say the horse not grass. Um, <laughs> or I could say the horse isn't eating grass and the nt is attaching to the is, which is again, not a separate auxiliary verb that specifically makes it negation. And that's very different to a language like Irish, where the negation changes depending on whether it is happening now or happened in the past. Oh, neat. So in the present, it is ni and in the past, it is ni or. Oh, interesting. So that's something that English doesn't do. And what percent of languages do that kind of auxiliary verb for negation? It's around 20% of languages in the database have that. And then the final type of auxiliary use they coded for was like in an English example, the grass was eaten by the horse. Since the horse didn't get its grass before, I want to <laughs> make sure it, it has had it now. Um, and that passive usage is found in about 10% of languages. And the really nice thing about a database like GramBank is that we can click on the map and see that for these passives, there's this big chain of languages that spread down through the Europe, India, Indo-European area, and then down into Southeast Asia. That 10% of languages tend to be focused in that area. And there are large parts of the Pacific and Africa and North and South America where there aren't as many languages that do this. So we see some kind of common themes among specific languages of certain families or in certain areas uh, that tend to more likely do this. And that's one of the really useful benefits of a big database of features like this. And, and one that's based on a map where you have all of these languages as points on a map. Yeah, totally. That's really neat. And seeing like languages that are related to each other or just languages that have had contact with each other over thousands and thousands of years of history. And, you know, many people have been bilingual and borrowed things from one language to the next. And you can see these sort of aerial groupings of different languages. So auxiliaries are very neat, but clearly they're not a thing that all languages necessarily feel the need to use. So if a language isn't using an auxiliary, what are some of the things that they could be doing instead? Rambank tends to code things just on a yes or no basis. So if it doesn't have it, it's just coded as a no. But we know there are some other strategies if you're not using an auxiliary that you can use to get the same kind of function. 
Right. So one obvious idea would be to use a suffix or a prefix. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to say something like the grass was eaten, you could add some sort of ending or some sort of prefix onto eat that would make it passive instead of having the was eaten part make it passive. This is a strategy that lots of languages do. You might have a prefix for negation instead of some strategy that uses an auxiliary. And you can also use a different type of word. So instead of something being specifically you're recruiting a helping verb that is verby to do your meaning, you could also have a particle, which is a glorious linguistic catch-all term for, I don't know, it's a word doing something. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's not obviously a verb, it's not obviously a noun, it's just sort of a word that's there and doesn't really change its form, like not, which I think yeah. is a negative particle. Yeah. So something like not is a way of expressing negation rather than changing sort of the end of the word, the beginning of the word. You can have, let's just stick in another word. And not, I don't think anybody thinks not is a verb in English. I don't know, but different linguists use different criteria for defining what is a verb and what is a particle. So uh, if they have an argument to make for it, then it'd be interesting to hear. But I think in English, you know, our sort of standard tests for verbhood, the horse, not the apple, doesn't seem like it's acting like a verb there. So you could use other words that aren't necessarily verbs to express negation or passives or any of these sort of complicated, tensey, timey, timeliney things. You could say something like, the horse habitually eats grass. And we have to use habitually there or regularly, and it makes you realize just how elegant that AAVE construction is using habitual be for the horse be eating grass. Right. Or I eat already compared to I have eaten the already or the usually or the habitually. So sort of adverby things can also sometimes express some of these meanings as well. So we've given a lot of love to have as a very common copula. We have. <laughs> we have. But also, B is a very common copula in a bunch of languages. We are going to give it some love. Basque uses B as a copula. Oh, our isolate language of Europe. Yes. I don't know enough about the history of Basque to know whether this is related to contact with a bunch of other Indo-European languages in the sort of Spain-France region where Basque is spoken, or whether this is something that is passed down from historical Proto-Basque, but it does use B as an auxiliary. Okay, so still in the European neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But we don't need to stay in that neighborhood. Palestinian Arabic is another language that has been analyzed as using B as an auxiliary. Very nice. So we have a, an example where something like she wrote is done without an auxiliary, and then something like she used to write uses B to express that sort of used to meaning. Hmm. Used to is another interesting example of an auxiliary in English, actually, now that we're thinking about it. While we're collecting them. Compared to used two pencils to write. Hmm. Yes. And then also Kanande, which is a Bantu language, uses B as an auxiliary. Excellent. I have a rather violent example here, which is we hit recently, not today, and we are hitting are both forms of the verb that change based on a prefix. And then we were recently, not today, hitting is a form of the verb that uses be to express part of that meaning. So all using the same be verb, but in slightly different ways and to achieve different grammatical ends. Exactly. And sort of showcasing some of the ranges of examples of different types of meanings, whether that's recent past or used to, or other types of meanings that can be expressed with an auxiliary, just depending on what your language is into. So while they're not the only verbs that can become auxiliaries, have and be deserve special shout outs for being the workhorses of auxiliaries across many languages. Yeah, we could think of, you know, auxiliary verbs as you know, if you are just a person with a shovel, uh, with a rake trying to plant some seeds, you're going to have a bit more difficulty than if you have a plow where you have a, you know, a horse that can draw it and help you out with your plowing. So you have, you know, the horse helping you out. I think maybe we should think of it as an ox driven plow instead of an ox driven plow. <laughs> Oh no, these words sound exactly the same for me. Ox as in oxen, the animal, and ox as in auxiliary sound exactly the same for me. This is disappointing where ox and orcs are another thing where I don't have a merger. <laughs> I think actually English might be the only language that has the ox-ox merger. Okay. Because auxiliary comes from French, and so French has auxiliaire to mean the grammatical thing, but then the animal 
like a male cow is just a boof, like a beef. Okay. Whereas like German has ox, as in the cow, but for the grammatical thing, it has hilfsverb, which just means help verb. Oh, a much more transparent root than uh, English borrowing French auxiliary. But it does let us make this spectacular joke, which is that you can have a an ox-driven verb. And there are a few people, including friend of the podcast Kirby Conrad, who sometimes jocularly pluralize ox as an auxiliary as oxen, like the cow. Oh, I am definitely going to start calling them oxen from now on. <laughs> it's a nice souvenir from our trip to the farm. <laughs> For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get aesthetic IPA posters, IPA scarves, lots of linguistics t-shirts, and other Lingthusiasm merch at Lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. Have you listened to all the Lingthusiasm episodes and you wish there were more? You can get access to an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, plus our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Have you gotten really into linguistics and you wish you had more people to talk with about it? Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans. Plus, all patrons help keep the show ad-free. Recent bonus topics include a live show Q&A with Kirby Conrad, our 2022 listener survey responses, and using linguistics in the workplace. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who is curious about language. And don't forget to ask us your linguistic advice questions by the 1st of September 2023. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirala, and our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!